Voila! <laughs> so, welcome to Conscientiousness. In this video, we're going to do a deep dive, a super deep dive in conscientiousness because we really want to understand what it is and what it's like to be conscientious. If you're highly conscientious, you'll be able to relate to a lot of this stuff. Uh, we also want to be able to put ourselves in the shoes of someone that's highly conscientious so we can understand them better, so we can communicate with them better. So, this video is broken up into uh, three major pieces. So, the first piece, we're going to look at the traits. What is conscientiousness? Uh, what is the hierarchy of the different facets of conscientiousness? Uh, and this, we're also going to look at uh, you know, the positive and negative uh, life consequences of, of being uh, conscientiousness, of being conscientious. Uh, second, we're going to look at how to tell if someone's conscientious or not. Some of the questions you can ask, some of the interactions uh, that you can have, and um, we're also going to talk about how to talk to people who are highly conscientious. And third, which is probably the most important part, is how to think of conscientiousness in relation to the other traits. Because most people aren't just conscientious. They're also conscientious and they might be agreeable and to some degree and extroverted to some degree and open to some degree and, and neurotic to some degree. So in combination with other traits, how does it fit in? So let's jump in. But before we do that, I have a few links for you down below. One is for the test. If you haven't taken a personality test yet, you can go ahead and take the Big Five test. It's free. Also, uh, I'll be putting together a PDF with all this stuff on it. So if you want something to look at, um, it'll be down there as well. And if you want to contact me, you can uh, email, text me or email me here in here. And uh, also take a look at the other uh, five traits below. So without further ado, let's jump in. So what is conscientious? What does it mean to be conscientious? What is conscientiousness? It's obviously one of the big five uh, traits. And the best way to think about it is, is to think about someone that you know very intimately, someone in your life hopefully, or maybe yourself, that is really, really conscientious. And it's gonna help solidify this for you. So um, the, best, the, the best example of, of someone that's very high uh, conscientious is someone that's really, really detail-oriented, someone that likes to plan and organize and schedule everything. They have a routine. And so on one aspect, they're able to organize their life really, really well. And, and this kind of falls under the organization facet of conscientiousness. Then on the second side, they, they don't just organize, but they're, they're able to overcome obstacles. They're able to carry out their plans. They're able to finish what they start. They make quick decisions and they get things done. And that's the industrious part of conscientiousness, right? Some of the other facets are like traditionalism. People that are conscientious um, like to think in the box. They like to know the territory really well and they like to optimize it. They have this like inner duty, this inner sense to contribute and to make things the best they can, right? And these things aren't things that are unknown, but they're things that are known or things that are known very well. So they have a proclivity towards traditionalism, right? Which is another facet of, of conscientiousness. Uh, c traditionalism opposed to, uh, say, some of the high openness that doesn't have a proclivity towards traditionalism. They want to try new things and new strategies to solve problems. Uh, people that are high in traditionalism, um, in essence, what they're doing is that they want to keep things focused on what they know has worked in the past and to improve on it. Because, you know, it's, it's, it's a proven system, if you will. They also tend to be more conservative in their beliefs and they also tend to be um, lower in openness. Another facet of conscientiousness is responsibility. So people that are really high in conscientiousness, they're also going to be responsible. They're going to keep their appointments, they're gonna keep their schedules, uh, they're going to meet people when they say they are, they're going to keep their word, right? They're going to do what they say they're going to do. Um, and, and the most interesting part of conscientiousness is, is uh, the self-discipline portion of it. And this is, this is one of the core elements of conscientiousness. So in this element, someone is capable of, of two things. One is forethought, that is they can, they can see that you know, doing certain behaviors, for example, will be better for them in the long run, and so they're going to forego uh, or delay their gratification. And that falls under a special category of effortful control. In other words, they're being tempted by something, maybe it's food, or maybe it's a pretty girl, or maybe it's just having fun with friends, but instead of you know, letting into this temptation, what they're saying instead is like, hey, I have a responsibility, I, I, I have to do this 
uh, I have to study tonight instead of going out with my friends or you know I have to put the, the taco down <laughs> or the piece of pizza down and, and I'll eat the salad instead right so they have a sense of self-discipline and they're willing to delay gratification so overall conscientiousness has really really good uh, you know life impact results over the long term people that are higher, higher in conscientiousness uh, and end up having better job satisfaction they end up doing better in school um, they end up being wealthier over time uh, because they're not frivolously spending. They're, they're saving their money instead or investing it. Uh, people that are high in consciousness are also uh, healthier at each stage of their life. Uh, and that's because they're not eating the junk food, you know, for example. Um, they take that personal responsibility seriously. So those are the benefits of conscientiousness. Now, um, I think in terms of motivations, the best way to think about what motivates someone at the most core level when it comes to conscientiousness is that they feel a duty to contribute and to do an excellent job. So uh, if you're highly conscientious, when you do a good job at something, you know, if you're a student and you get an A or if you're, a, a, you know, an employee uh, and you work, for, you know, for your company and you do a good job on, on a research project, for example, whatever the project is, uh, and you get a standing wish, that will make you feel great, right? That's part of the reward, knowing that you did a fantastic, a phenomenal job. And so that's part of the core motivation. Um, someone that's highly conscientious is going to have a hard time not doing anything. They're gonna have a hard time just sitting around and relaxing because they'll see it as a waste of time. Um, so they have this guilt around not working or not contributing to society. So later in age, people that are highly conscientious, uh, let's say in their retirement age, they're more likely to volunteer. In a way, what conscientiousness is, is a regulatory system uh, that helps organize and regulate um, how you approach and achieve goals and, um, how, and the self-discipline portion where you delay gratification so you can do that. And so, uh, in one sense, one of the best ways we can think of conscientiousness is from a hierarchical approach. And the reason why this is useful uh, is because conscientiousness isn't just one thing. If you notice, it, we're already using a number of different facets. And so each facet um, has it, it, you know, it, it's, its own silo in a way. So you could be really high in industriousness, for example, and you might not, you might be lower in, or, you know, you know, an organization. So you might be more disorganized and really industrious. So you're, you're not as good at uh, planning. You're not as detailed. You're not as neat. Um, you're not as organized. But you're great at carrying out the plans that you do have, or someone else's plans, for example. Uh, you might really be great at like self-discipline, but maybe you're not neat, right? And so when we look at it with the hierarchical approach, there's two main categories that we can break things down into. Um, one is a proactive component. And this is a, a proactive component because it goes out into the world and it looks to manifest uh, this, these, you know, these traits and in, in, in personalities that have their own motivation. They're looking to manifest themselves into the world. Um, and on the other side, you have the inhibitory uh, component which is the component that we talked about earlier. It's the self-discipline component. It's the component that regulates temptation. So the facets fall like this. Uh, for the proactive component, the main facets are industriousness, organization, and responsibility. So organization, we already talked about a little bit. It's planning, scheduling, organizing. It's, it's being detailed. It's being neat. It's being clean, okay? In, in, in one way, the best way to think about organization is that organization happens at, at a physical level, like it happens at your office, it happens at your home, it happens in the way you present yourself, right? If someone's really neat and clean, you can tell right away. Industriousness is kind of, it, it's, it's very behavioral. It's, it's, it's how you approach work and how you approach doing things, right? Someone that's very industrious will never quit. They make decisions quickly and easily. They're competent, they know what they're doing. Um, they finish what they start, they carry on, right? They're very persistent, they don't give up. And someone who's responsible has this sense of obligation to do the things they say that we're going to do. Uh, responsibility kind of 
overlaps to, to a large degree with agreeableness because responsibility implies that there's another party, party that you're responsible to. And so in this way, responsibility is kind of has one foot in agreeableness and has another foot in conscientiousness. The agreeableness portion of it is that it's directed towards people. Um, the conscientious portion of it is the sense of responsibility that, that, that it inhibits. And then obviously we already talked about the self-discipline part, which is the inhibitory component of conscientiousness. Now, um, some very overall descriptions, you know, how can you tell if someone's conscientious? Uh, are they careful or careless? Are they organized or disorganized? Are they disciplined or are they weak-willed? Are they hardworking or are they kind of lazy? Um, you know, are, do, are they, do they take unnecessary risks or are they conservative? So that's kind of a good overview of it. In terms of like cognition and how someone that is conscientious sees the world, they like to keep the world in boxes. And what does that mean? Well. They like to have things well-defined and well-structured and well-understood so they can organize it and then follow through with a plan. Now, conversely, someone that's really high in openness is going to do something very different. They're going to look at these boxes, these conceptual boxes, and they're going to break them up just so they can see what's inside. They're going to see a lot of gray. They're going to see a lot of overlap. They're going to want to play around with the boxes and create something new. And this is where high openness and, and conscientiousness kind of have a little bit of a conflict. And that is that someone that's highly conscientious is more detail-oriented instead of being big picture-oriented. They're more focused on the, you know, their goal that they want to achieve versus exploring all possibilities. And the, the, the cost of this is that people that are highly conscientious are going to be great at getting from point A to point B even if they're going in the wrong direction. So what that also means is that they're going to have a hard time adjusting in the middle. So once they're, they've set, once the train's headed <laughs> on its route, it's, it, it's going there. And you're going to have a hard time moving someone that's conscientious away from a goal that's no longer relevant. Conscientiousness, as we talked earlier, has a lot of benefits, right? Um, better marital success, better job success better school success. Uh, it's the second best predictor of success in life. Um, you're going to be healthier, going to be wealthier um, by being highly conscientious. It's a very, very effective uh, trait to have. On the, on the downside is like with any trait, if you take it too far, it becomes pathological. So on the organization side, um, it's connected to being neat, which is connected to being clean. And that's because highly conscientious people have a high disgust sensitivity and that becomes dangerous because the more you become uh, sensitive to disgust um, the, the more you're going to open your the, the more you're going to close off the boxes so much that the environment becomes pathological and that becomes an environment where um, it has a proclivity towards authoritarianism moreover people that are highly conscientious um, when taken to an extreme have a problem with OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, or everything always need, need, needing to be just right and perfect. Um, you know, they're known as being anal. <laughs> and, and, and when you externalize it, uh, it, 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 you see it in the environment. When you internalize this, what happens is, you know, you might have something like anorexia. So someone feels disgusted by their own body, and then so they want to limit the amount of food they eat and so on. So those are some of the positives and negatives of conscientiousness. So now let's talk about part two. How do you know if you're talking to someone that's conscientious? So a lot of the stuff we, we already discussed is going to get you like 80% there. But there's a few things you should know. So one is there's a difference between um, traits that a person is wired to uh, see the world through naturally in other words, uh, genetically, versus uh, character adaptations that they've learned through life, right? And out of all the traits, conscientiousness is the one that people learn the best. This is the one that 
uh, you can see the biggest increase in uh, over time uh, and an average population. So uh, generally like conscientious children uh, will be conscientious as children, they will drop off and become more irresponsible in their teenage years and then they'll pick back up in their young adulthood and, and then conscientiousness will grow from young adulthood to late adulthood uh, to their older age. They're going to continue to be more and more conscientious. In that first part, uh, you know, in their 20s, in their, in early adulthood, they're going to become more industrious. Uh, in their later adulthood, they're going to become a little bit more conservative. But there is this upward trajectory. And part of the reason is because we, get, we reward people for being conscientious, right? Let's say that you're a child that is like, you know, 50-50 in conscientiousness. And you're like, like, let's say you're dead set average. And you grow up in an environment that's highly conscientious. So what does that mean? That means that let's say your parents are always rewarding you when you get good grades and punishing you when you get bad grades. And so then um, what you do to respond to that environment is you study harder, which makes you more conscientious. You get good grades, so you get a reward. And your parents uh, and, and, and the school you know, rewards you for that reward. And, that, and then over time, you, 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 you study even more the next time around. You get even better grade and now it becomes a, a, a positive cycle. And that positive cycle then contributes to your identity, right? Not only is it becoming easier to study and you're getting better grades, but now in your mind, you're also a quote unquote good student and good students study hard, right? And so from a bottoms up approach, you've incorporated these traits. And now your brain is also um, changing and evolving so you are becoming more conscientious. And when it comes to measuring people on conscientiousness, this is why it's the hardest thing to measure because we don't know to what extent it was a character adaptation versus just natural. And, and what that means is that someone could be really hardworking at work and, 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 and seem conscientious at work and then lazy at home, right? And so when we go to measure people or to evaluate, it, there's some differences in terms of like if someone's conscientious or not, it could be somewhat ambiguous. Uh, the other thing to note is that, you know, motivation really matters because uh, so, someone might be hardworking um, because they're extremely conscientious or they might be hardworking because they're extremely passionate about what they're doing, right? So someone that's high in openness will fall into the latter category. Someone that's hardworking just because, it, because it's their job and their duty will fall into, uh, in, in the former category. So the why matters. The other thing that matters is, um, is, is, you know, how permanent the, the behavior is, right? Um, if, you know, anyone can do their homework once, right? So if you're observing somebody and, they're, and they do a great job and you see them three, four times they do a great job, that's a lot different than if they do it for an entire year, right? So with all this in mind, like, what are some of the best ways to predict whether someone's conscientious or not? So um, we can start in the, at the very top. When you first meet somebody, you know, how are they dressed? How are they presenting themselves? Um, are, are they're like neat and, and, or, and clean and orderly and they, and they behave, behave in a very, very uh, formal way. Formality is another facet of conscientiousness. Then, and then those are, uh, that means that they're more likely to be conscientious. And, and, and when I talk about this, I always think of this in terms of probabilities, right? And when you think that someone has a high probability of being conscientious, what you can do is you can engage in a conversation with them that will test that theory out so you can find out if they are conscientious, okay? And um, so, so what does that look like? When you meet someone for the first time and you see how they're dressed in a very uh, formal way, they're, maybe they're wearing a tie and a suit, um, you know, everything is very neat and clean, their briefcase is organized, their office is organized, when you go to their house, their house is organized, okay? You, you notice that they run on schedule the biggest predictor of, of someone that's highly conscientious is going to be uh, that they're punctual. Because by virtue of being punctual, especially when you're punctual consistently, you're, you're showing all the other facets, right? In order to be punctual, you have to be able to, to plan well, okay? Which is, falls into the organization uh, facet. You have to be able, uh, you have to be industrious, which means you can overcome, you, you, can, you can carry out your plans and you can overcome obstacles, right? Who knows what happened that day? Maybe there was a, uh, you know, some sort of delay that he overcame.
but he showed us that he's capable of overcoming challenges. Uh, three, he's responsible. Like, he's meeting you at the time you guys agreed on. He's not keeping you waiting, which means that he, he has respect uh, for what you guys agreed on. He's keeping his word. And four, uh, he's delaying his own gratification because instead of doing those three other things, he could be you know, playing a video game or watching a video or, or, or listening to music or doing something fun. The biggest marker for someone that's highly conscientious is that they're always punctual. They're always on time. So what are some other ways you'll know that they're conscientious? So we already talked about their appearance, right? When they talk and when they think, do they think, are they more inside the box or outside the box? And the way you can test this is, how do they respond to new ideas? How do they respond to things that are not conventional? If someone is very conscientious, they're going to have a hard time with it. This is going to be, this is going to be brushing up, it's going to be brushing up to their, one of their limitations, okay? And they're not going to feel comfortable going past and into this new, uh, new unknown area. So that's another way you can know, see if someone's conscientious. Uh, an another marker for conscientiousness is also obviously like what they do for a living and what their hobbies are, right? Because with any of these big five, just I think one of the things, the most important things to remember is that essentially what they are is they're, they're filters into seeing the world in a certain place. So someone that's conscientious when they come into an environment and if, if something's out of place, it's going to bother them. It's going to literally jump out from the table and scream at them, fix me. And they can't do anything about that. That's just the way they're wired. So do you notice that? If something's out of place, does the person automatically put it back where it belongs? That's a marker for, 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 for someone that's highly conscientious. Um, how comfortable are they with changing their word? So that's another test you could, you, could, you could see. You're brushing them up against another limitation. And of course, one of the most important ones is the inhibitory component, right? Are they willing to delay gratification for something better? In other words, invest in the future. Are they willing to sacrifice? The thing about conscientiousness is, especially when it comes to the impulse control, it's, very, very, it's a very, very powerful thing because it keeps people on the straight and narrow, which could be a very, very good thing. We'll talk about that more later as we look at how conscientiousness relates to the other uh, four traits. So I hope this gives you kind of an overview of how to tell someone's conscientious. Um, so when it comes to jobs and hobbies, um, this is how I think about it. If someone has spent a lot of time <laughs> going to college and university and they have a degree and they have a professional job like a doctor, lawyer, accountant, engineer, etc. There's a pretty good chance that they're high in conscientiousness because that took a sacrifice. They saw, they saw it through. Uh, they did all the hard work necessary in order to get the diplomas and then to get a job and, and, and so on and so forth. High credit scores are a good sign of high conscientiousness. Do they pay their bills on time? Obviously, good sign of high conscientiousness. In terms of um, hobbies, uh, people that are high in conscientiousness are going to enjoy hobbies that involve things that are detail-oriented. An example of this would be like a card collector or a watch collector or a car collector. You know, any type of collector really, right? If they're not looking at it strictly from an investment point of view, but they're really into the details, into the intricacies of what they're of what they're collecting, that's a marker for high conscientiousness. So when you ask someone, hey, what do you do for fun or what are your, some of your hobbies, what do you enjoy, right? People that are highly conscientious are going to have, com, uh, they're gonna have hobbies that mirror that, that trait because they're going to enjoy using the trait. They're gonna enjoy expressing the trait in the world. So I hope that gives you an idea of, of how to tell if someone's highly conscientious. And the last part, is how does conscientiousness relate to the other traits? Because nobody's just one thing, right? No one is just conscientious. They might also be high in extroversion. They might be high in openness uh, or, or agreeableness or, or neuroticism. So I think the best place to start is, is, is in this way. And, and this is also going to give you insight into relationships because the relationship you have with yourself, if you're highly conscientious, 
or if you're not so highly conscientiousness, it's going to be similar to the relationship you have with other people that have those same sort of traits, right? It, one way to think about it is there, these personality traits, people have these personality traits, but these personality traits also have people. So if you're high in conscientiousness, you're going to be responsible, careful, well-organized, you're gonna see things through and so on. You're also gonna be thinking more in the box. So when we say someone's high in conscientiousness from this exercise, we're gonna assume that this is going to be their highest and dominant trait. And, and that's the best way to think about it, is that you might be high or low in the other traits, but you're gonna have a dominant trait, which is going to be your dominant filter through which, way, which, through which you see the world, right? So if your dominant filter is conscientiousness, um, what does that mean? So let's say that you're high in conscientiousness and then you're also uh, high in extroversion and you're high in, in neuroticism, right? If you're high in those, in those areas, um, the conflict is going to come in, in areas of um, impulse control. So for example, someone that's high in extroversion, okay, uh, people that are extroverted tend to discount the future they tend to be more about the present and enjoying life in the moment, having fun, okay? <laughs> Socializing, uh, going out and interacting with people, and they get things done through people. They're also impulsive, okay? Because they're willing to do the thing that's fun now, and then they are, um, they're optimists, so they're like, oh, the, the future will take care of itself, I don't have to worry about it. So since they since, since they're have this sort of view, then what happens is uh, they'll engage in more risky behavior. So if you're an, uh, high in extroversion uh, and high in conscientiousness, the, the, the conscientious part can keep the extroversion impulse control, uh, impulse part under control, right? And so then your conscientiousness can become a, a way to moderate and regulate your impulses when it comes to the extroversion side. And in an and extroversion, the impulse is always towards something that you desire, towards something that you want, towards something that is tempting. Now, neuroticism also tends to be impulsive, but for the exact opposite reason, right? So if extroversion is impulsive because it wants something and it's goal-oriented and it's seeking it, neuroticism does it out of fear. It does it because it's trying to avoid something it, it, it's it, it, it's doing it because it feels rushed and that there is no other way and you better do it now or otherwise you'll miss out. Kind of like FOMO. FOMO is a, a, a good example of, of a neurotic behavior. This is the fear of missing out. Again, impulse control. Highly conscientious people could regulate that. And so if you're high in uh, neuroticism and extroversion, you can focus in on your impulse control and control those two elements of your life that way. With agreeableness, conscientiousness and agreeableness kind of overlap in an interesting way. And, and we talked about it earlier. One is the responsibility. So um, they're, they're, they both have an inhibitory, effortful control aspect um, to their domain. So in conscientiousness, the effortful control is the responsibility towards other people. And to, to a large degree, towards your duty towards what you said you were going to do and the, the tasks and the plans and so on and so forth. In agreeableness, the duty is towards people and it's to do right by them and to do things that are good for them even when you don't want to. So imagine if there's, um, imagine there's, there's an accident, there's someone that needs help. People that are high or in agreeableness are more likely to help than people that are lower in agreeableness or any other type. And that is because they feel like they owe it to help even though they may not want to. And so that's kind of like the overlap uh, between the two. And with openness, there's a natural conflict. So people that are high in conscientiousness are going to have a natural conflict with high, people high in openness, or these two traits are gonna have a conflict within you to some degree. And that is because the openness likes to explore uncharted waters. It, try, it wants to explore the unknown. and wants to try new things. It, try, it wants to dissect the ideas, break the ideas down, and see, if, see what happens when you break them. It literally saws off the very branch that it's sitting on. It has, it has um, 
has a fascination for novel things that are new. Whereas conscientiousness is, is, is the opposite. It, it wants to keep things in the box. It's afraid of what will happen if, if, if things get you know, taken out of the box and everything's, everything's all over because then you have chaos. It's, it's going to have a hard time going into the unknown because what's the point? We already know this and it's working. So this, this is kind of the, the natural um, balance between high openness and high conscientiousness. Usually people that are high in openness are going to be a little bit lower in conscientiousness. And it's going to be on the organizational side. They could still be high openness and then very high industriousness. And that's a unique combination. What that allows people to do is, I think a great example of this would be someone like Mark Zuckerberg. Um, he's obviously very, very, you know, in, in some way creative, right? He created this amazing company, <laughs> not in terms of what it does, but in terms of its success. And he did it because he saw through and the plan each time. But at each point, he was open-minded enough to explore all the possibilities and to figure which one he wanted most. And then if it didn't work, he would deviate from the plan and he used data uh, in order to make decisions. So that's a good combination of high openness and high in industriousness in, in his case. And last piece of, piece of this is that when you have a partner and one of you uh, is going to be more high on conscientiousness than the other. And this is why it's important because a lot of times conscientiousness it does lead to better relationships because partners are more willing to talk problems out uh, and not hold grudges uh, and move on. Uh, in other words, do the work and overcome obstacles. <laughs> um, on the other hand, um, if you're, let's say, higher in conscientiousness than your partner, then when, when something is a mess or a miss or something's not scheduled or planned, it's going to scream out at you before it screams out at them. And that might drive you crazy because that's not something that's gonna change, right? If you're higher in conscientiousness, you're gonna be the one that notices it first. Now, they might notice it five minutes, 10 minutes, or even five seconds later than you, but that means that for those five, 10 seconds or minutes uh, or, or longer, that it's been festering inside of you, and in them, it hasn't been festering. So, uh, in relationships, that's one of the things that I would put on the table right away is figure out how conscientious you are, how conscientious they are in terms of organization and a neat and clean environment and, and make sure that it doesn't come between you. So I hope you enjoyed this overview on conscientiousness. We did a real deep dive. Um, I'm going to have some notes and presentations down below. And if you want to contact me, you can. You can text me or you can email me here and here. Then remember to subscribe and hit the bell and we'll see you in the next video.